Alrighty. So my name is Peter Marchese. I'm going to be going over the current state of reality capture. So before I get rolling, let's have a couple of questions. Who here actually knows what reality capture is by hands? Alrighty. So in the beginning part of this, it might be a little bit boring for you, but I'll be going out of the PowerPoint into some software, so hopefully a little more interesting. Now, everybody here is familiar with Revit, I'm assuming, right? Okay. So everybody here also familiar with Autodesk 360? Just a handful of heads. Okay, cool. So the rest of that will actually be interesting as well. So if there are any questions, feel free to shout them out. I have no problem bouncing around. Okay? So we're going to start off with the typical who am I stuff. So I work for Microdesk. We're an AECO partner. We've been around for over 11 years now. Uh, or more than that, actually. We've got 11 offices on the East Coast and on the West Coast as well as Chicago. So we're all over the place. We have, at this point, probably close to, closer to 100 than 90. Uh, technology consultants. So that number is not sales or management. That's actually all the techies. And all of us actually come from the industry. I worked in architecture for about nine years before bouncing out to this. So it's like, my name is Peter Marchese again, senior consultant. Uh, I tend to deal with all the, uh, the fun, weird stuff for BIM. So if somebody says program can't do it, I get the fun job of trying to prove it wrong and figure out how to make it work one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. So reality capture. What is reality capture? For the most part, when everybody thinks of reality capture, the first thing they think of is something like a laser scanner. So whether it's like a total station, something like that. And then the end result is something like this. So a whole lot of pixels all over the place. Now, what reality capture really is, is the process of taking literally the reality of the real world and capturing that digitally. So it could be something as simple as a very nice interior for a residence or a commercial. It could be something like this where you actually have these little cubes or, or globes. I'll show you those a little bit, a little bit later. But the main purpose for this is, once we have it, what do we do with it? So what this image actually is, is taking a point cloud that we actually got from a uh, total stations underground, and then actually bringing that into Revit and then modeling around that. So now that we actually have the existing conditions that we can work with for real design, real construction, clashes, pretty much anything and everything that we want to actually work with. So if you go down into some place like this where you actually have a lot of arcs, a lot of ins and outs, a lot of hard spaces to actually measure, and you want to understand how much space do you really have. So this makes it a lot easier than going down there with a pencil and some paper and a couple of strings to try to figure out where things are. Now, <clears throat> the basic kinds of reality capture come, usually comes down to like laser, photo, and sensor based. Laser scanning again, for the most part, everybody tends to think of is one of the scanners that are set up on a tripod. Put it there, maybe go get some coffee, come back, the new ones are really fast. If you don't know how these work, what they actually do is it starts off reflecting a laser off of a little mirror. That mirror spins around really, really fast and tends to capture hundreds of thousands of points within minutes or seconds depending on the version that you're working with. So from that it actually creates a large file, sometimes gigs, of points that actually include a lot of other information in it. Now, outside of the typical one that you'll see here on, a, on the uh, tripod, you can also mount these on vehicles. So there's a lot of times when you actually will mount something like this onto a plane to cover a large swaths of land very quickly, but still actually get a very accurate sensor reading. And a lot of this depends on what kind of sensor you're using, whether it's long range, short range, what the weather might be that day, and also the altitude that you're flying. Now, in addition to putting this on a plane, it makes sense that you're also going to put this on something like a car. And when you do it like that, you can actually go through and actually scan very specific locations for infrastructure. So if anybody here has actually been to the uh, BIM form, everybody, anybody ever went to those? A couple. Did you go to the one out in uh, Colorado in Denver? No? One of the presentations out there actually was talking about how they ended up scanning an entire highway system, including tunnels, to make sure that the components of their project could actually get shipped to the site. So that the things that they were designing, yeah, they'll work on the site, they'll work here, but can we actually get them there in one piece that's economical? So that's just another reason why this actually is useful. So this is the laser scanning one. Now, another one that tends to get lumped in with laser scanning is something called structured light. So if anybody's familiar with that, more than likely it's from the little connect that you got with the first 360. Another version that a few people might notice on the right is a new thing called the structure sensor. So that actually went through Kickstarter. You can attach it to an Android device as well as your iPad or iPad mini. And you can actually use the iPad to actually go through and scan a room or scan objects. Now, these tend to work by actually having something like this a lot of dots overlaid on a sensor or overlaid on an object. So at this point, if you were to look at it through, through a camera that actually can see infrared, you'd end up seeing a whole lot of dots all over the place. What it ends up doing is having that projector that puts the image on the surface 
and two different cameras look at it from different locations, and it gets an idea of the edges, where all these points are. Now, this tends to be very accurate, but the problem is their distance is very limited. So unlike laser scanning, which can go over a kilometer, this is usually within a few feet or to the end of maybe a room. And this is much more limited in terms of visible light. If it's very bright out, it can actually impact that. But again, if you want to play around with things, I've honestly used my Kinect a lot more for scanning rooms and hacking it than I ever did for any video games. So. Now, outside of that, oh, and also they do make a couple of uh, semi-professional versions. So if you don't want to play with the Kinect, you want to get something that really works, they do have those. Now, the next one is photogrammetry. Has anybody here ever heard of that? <coughs> wow, okay, cool, nice. Anybody actually know how it works? That's normal, don't worry. So, photogrammetry essentially is nothing more than taking photographs. It doesn't have to be a high-end DSLR. It can actually be a cell phone. And one of the things I'll show later is actually with my cell phone. So, from that, we're also seeing a lot more things where they're using quad coppers with cameras on it. And you can also set them up so that they're using a little UAV or a plane with the camera. How you get the photos really doesn't matter. So whether it's you know, setting up a guy in a helicopter for a couple of grand or a guy with a toy helicopter for a couple of hundred, the real thing that matters is the quality. Now in terms of how these actually work, if anybody here has ever drawn a perspective by hand, so one of the things you end up trying to figure out is where's my vanishing points, where's my planes, so that everything that I draw actually understands where it's going back to. So anybody here ever use SketchUp? Yep. Anybody ever use the photo match in SketchUp? Okay, never mind then. So if you have, you understand how this works then. Because that's really all the computer is doing. So with specific algorithms, it learns, it looks at it, and it can actually see where edges are. So it's actually trying to do the same thing that we would do if you we were trying to draw a perspective by hand. It's figuring out where the vanishing points are, and then matching the photos together on its own, and then stitching them together. So that's typically why when you do this with photogrammetry, you want to get as much of it in the frame as possible. If you're too close, it can't understand how things work together. And if you're too far away where nothing's in detail, it's not really able to figure it out either. So it's kind of that sweet spot. <coughs> now another one is sensor based. Now this one is kind of new. If anybody here is really big on Macs, you might have heard that Apple's actually putting in uh, indoor mapping into the next version of the phone. So even though it's new, it's going to start getting very popular very quickly. And I have a couple of things at the very end I'll talk about as well. Now these ones here do not do point clouds. But point clouds are not the only method of reality capture. Again, the goal here is to actually get what's going on in the real world into a program that I can actually do work with. So in these cases, you have two of them that can actually give you me floor plans. So the one on the left, uh, God, I always forget the name. I think it's uh, Room Scan, and the other one is, I will figure out the name in a minute. So essentially what they do is the one on the left is a little bit more high tech in that. I hold the phone or the iPad up against the wall, tell it to go, and it actually uses all the gyroscopes and the accelerometers and tracks me moving around. Uh, might be a little hard to see on there, but you actually have lines here where it shows you what it feels your path actually was moving through the room. So it actually uses that. You can tell it where doors are, where windows are, and it builds you a floor plan. The other one requires more manual input in that I'm using photos, not so much to have the computer stitch it together, but it actually looks at the photo, understands where the corners are, and I actually build it from that. So as long as it has something in there that has scale, it puts it together. So far so good. Any questions? Awesome, everyone's actually slow. So, in terms of point clouds, the kind of data that they collect. Most of the time, if you actually see a point cloud, you're going to see something like this. So, all these points in space, the further out you look, the more smooth or solid it actually looks. If you zoom in really tight, it's kind of like a screen door. Then you actually see through it and you see all the gaps. Now, the point cloud itself includes a lot of data inside each individual point. So, typically when you're looking at this, you're looking at the red, green, blue value. So it's kind of like a TV. All the different pixels have specific colors, and when you put them next to each other, they're clean. The other thing, though, is that they actually include a lot of other data. Not all the time, but typically. So in this case, it's the exact same scan, but right now it's showing me elevation data. So I can actually look at it and get an idea of where heights are. Now it's actually showing me the, uh, the strength of the actual point cloud. So the more reflective light that comes back, the stronger the light is, it's actually giving me that information. So if you work with uh, uh, rendering a lot, in this case it's giving me the normals. And the last one, you see all these little globes floating around? Each globe is a different location that a scan was taken from. So in this case, these different colors are showing me what data came from what scanned location. So I think of it like layers. So it's giving me a different color for each location so I can see what came from where. Again, the amount of information that you get really kind of depends on where you got the scan from. If it's from, coming from like a Kinect, 
expect really simple data. If it's coming from, you know, $10,000 scanner, you can expect a lot more. So in some cases, it's typical of you're going to get what you pay for. Now, from that, in terms of the benefits of reality capture, it's pretty much anything that you want. Any time that you could actually take advantage of having the knowledge of the existing conditions, that's what it can work for. If you're using this for as-builds, so you're going to be doing more work on, a new, on an existing building, now I know exactly where things are. Most, it, most cases, anybody who's worked in architecture for a while, they have at least one story where they got burned where somebody told them or the old drawing said this building was this big or this room was this big, and then they get to the site you know, a couple of months, sometimes years later, and they find out that now there's a $20,000 change order because it can't fit. This kind of alleviates that, or at least part, like any tool, it helps you alleviate that. Now, the image that I have up there is actually from New York City. One of the reasons I have this here is in 2010, using one of the plane LIDARs, it actually flew over the city with the intent of finding out how much of New York's rooftops could actually be utilized for solar power generation. So they actually scanned it, used an algorithm to actually look at the state of the roofs, what the angle was, how much space was usable. You know, then it actually ran through and figured out that 66% and change could be actually utilized for solar power. So that was back in 2010. They actually put the data out in 11. There's actually a website that you can go to to actually see the map of where everything actually is and where they feel these are where solar is and this is where we can actually improve on it. So it can be used for pretty much anything. This depends on what you want to utilize that data for. Any questions before I roll into the software? Nope. All right. So the three programs I'm going to look at tonight are all from Autodesk. So Revit User Group, for the most part, everybody here has Revit, I'm assuming which means that you actually already have access to all three programs. So recap on the desktop actually comes with your suites. So if you have the building design suite, you've already got that. If you have an Autodesk username, meaning you can log into one of the 360 sites, you have access to recap and Project Memento is on the labs page or the, uh, the feedback page now. So you can download that for free and try it out. So first things first, if I open up the right one here. So this is one of the sample decks from Autodesk. Reason I'm using it is number one, most of the other ones I have that are really interesting, I can't show because they're your clients. The other thing is it actually has information in it that's easy to work with. Now, what I'm looking at right now is point cloud. Or you can start to see some breaks in it, you can see the openings inside of this. So this actually is all the scan data from a specific room of Autodesk's workshop. Now, these two orbs, those orbs are the location where the actual scans were taken. That's why there's essentially a shadow on the ground. So you know the scanner can't capture the data that it was actually sitting on. Now, the thing with these orbs is that if you notice how I'm hovering over that one, and it's actually good at it showing, it shows what looks like a panoramic video or a panoramic view. If I click on that, that actually shows me the panoramic camera shot that it takes. So a lot of these newer ones, in addition to uh, providing me with the point cloud data, they actually provide me with a photo. Now, the nice thing is, even though it's still a photo, it still understands where things are in that photo. So I can also get my distance here and get measurements off of the existing conditions. I can do that here from the photos as well. So something inside of here is not exactly clear, maybe there's a hard spot or something. I can pop into these and actually see a little bit clearer and actually still get my measurements and put notes and comments in there. Now, in terms of things, if anybody here has ever used a point cloud, one of the things you'll tend to say is that it's cumbersome or unwieldy. You know, if you have a real one, it's not 200 megs, it's not going to be smaller than your Revit file. And some of these ones that I've worked with can be in the ten, tens of gigs. So not exactly that much fun to work on. And the problem is, after you've uh, had somebody that does the scan, so if you pay somebody to do it as a consulting, what they'll tend to do is they'll pull all their scans that they did and mesh them together. So that way, rather than having all these different things that have different origins, they give you one file, everything's where it should be, and then you can use that. Problem is, if you bring in the Revit, it's probably going to kill it. One of the benefits of this, and in some respects one of the main benefits of it, is that you can break this file up into different regions. So think of it like layers. If I click on wall or floor, notice how it highlights all of the walls or floors. Now this isn't something where it's intelligent and automatically scans and it understands where the walls or floors are. But based on the tools here, you can select by window like normal, you can draw a fence around things. But the real benefit is the plane. So if I'm bringing this in this the Revit, I probably couldn't care less about that table in the middle of the room. So I want to remove that before I actually take this uh, uh, point cloud into Revit. So if I come down to Window, do Plane, I'll tell it what my depth is or my variance is, essentially, and I'll click a couple of times on the floor. 
Once I'm done with that, it actually selects all of the points that are within that range on that floor. Now that I've actually selected it, I can just come over here and either say I want to clear it, delete it, or drop it into a specific region or layer. What that allows me to do is then I can control it. I can turn that on, I can turn that off. So if I actually do turn off the floor, now it's really easy for me to just draw a window around the furniture and then delete that if I never need it again. So it's a method for me to actually manage all the point clouds that I'm receiving. If I have a very large point cloud that comes in, I'll actually compartmentalize it and break it up into wings, floors, rooms. And that way when I load it into Revit, AutoCAD, Navisworks, wherever I'm going to actually be taking advantage of it, I can actually bring in only the components that I need, or only the components that I need at that point in time. So that, similar to anything else, I'm not dealing with 10 gigs worth of data. I'm dealing with maybe three or 400 megs at a time. Load it, work on it, unload it. Make sense? Cool. Now, outside of just being able to modify my regions, one of the other things I can actually do is modify how those regions look. So, one of the uh, images that I showed before showed how I can actually look at this data in different methods. If I come over here, I can come in and look at my red, green, blue values. I can look at things in an elevation or intensity. And while this looks really neat or maybe just weird, this actually does have a benefit. Sometimes if you're doing scans interiors, the red, green, blue value that it gets really does depend on the lighting in the room. It's essentially taking a photograph of that. The laser itself can penetrate you know, darkness or light to actually get the right range. But whether or not it's going to be something that is easily identifiable by the human eye afterwards, it's just like taking a photo in a dark room. It might not give me the information I need. There's been projects I'm working, I've worked on where I've actually brought the point cloud into Revit and I'm trying to model it but I have no idea what's going on because it's all sort of like a black or brown mess right in the corner where the ceiling is. And I'm trying to find out maybe where a security camera is or a light or HVAC duct. So in that case, by changing this value and showing me different things, whether it's intensity, you know, that doesn't make much sense, but it makes it easier for me to discern different materials, different uh, areas of reflectivity. And the thing is, I'm doing this in recap. But when I save this information after cleaning it up and bring it into something else like Navisworks or Revit, I still have that control. I can still take this and then tweak it so that I'm looking at information in the method or the form that works best for myself. Now, other than that, while I'm in this tool, I can modify my lighting, my shading. If I want to make things transparent, I can do that. For some point clouds, if they're kind of messy, I can make the points look really big. There we go or I can make them a little bit smaller if I want to actually see things. In terms of making this work for other programs, I can actually update my origin. So if I get a scan and my origin is maybe three feet off the ground, or I really want the origin to be in the corner of this wall section, I can actually place that where I want. So again, when I bring it into another program, now it actually lines up where I want, or at least is more easily aligned with the rest of my work. And then from there, I can just turn things on and off in this view. Now, the nice thing is, it is it's still a relatively new program, so Autodesk at least makes it easy for you to send your feedback, good or bad, so that way they can tweak it. And there is actually a pro version of this. The only difference between the one that you get with your suites, or I shouldn't say the only, the main difference, is the ability to register multiple scans. So if somebody is giving you a bunch of individual scan pieces, like these orbs here, if somebody gave me those without actually putting them together, I can actually allow Recap to put them together for me automatically without actually having markers. So as long as they overlap enough, the software can actually figure out and say, okay, well, this is the same object that's in there, and they actually fit together like this. So that's one of the major differences. But otherwise, if you're just receiving point clouds and managing them or cleaning them up before actually utilizing them, the one that comes with the suites, that's all you need. Now, this one here is, for the most part, the simple one. I can actually hop in. I can change it. I can put dimensions in it. One of the other benefits I have is the ability to export out the different formats depending on what I want to do. I can also save it for use in, again, all the other suite tools. The other thing I can do is actually upload this to the cloud. So I mentioned before Autodesk 360. So if what I do is hop over here, so if you go to recap360.autodesk.com, to utilize this, all you need is an Autodesk login. So if you've ever done like a cloud rendering or logged on to download something from the subscription center or LATS, you've already got that login. And again, it's completely free to, to create. When you get on here, essentially what you're going to see is, well, depending on when you started with this, you might have a couple example files, you've got your tutorials. You're going to have a project gallery, though, if you've done this before. Now, what this allows me to do is create photo projects. 
Now, a photo project is me coming in here and saying, number one, what do I want to do? Do I want to spend any money or do I want it to be free? So if you've ever used the rendering tool, same idea. If I just want to do a preview version of this, so it's limited in the amount of photos I can upload and maybe the quality, it's not going to be as tight, no problem, completely free. If I tell it I want to do it as ultra, now I can actually do a few other things. I can assign actually units to this, so that way I can give it a correct scale. I can then bring it into other programs and utilize it. And then I can tell it what file formats I want to actually receive. So if I'm actually scanning something that I want to bring into Inventor, Max, Revit, Recap, I can actually pick which format I want. And the price doesn't go up depending on how many formats I ask for. It's always just going to be, or I shouldn't say always. At the moment, Autodesk has it for five points. So again, don't work for Autodesk. Don't yell at me if they change that. So essentially what I would do here is I would tell it what the name is, what I want to do, and then I would upload all the photos that I have. If you have a subscription and your username is connected to it, you can upload up to 250 photos. So at the moment, they're limiting it to that. If you don't have a subscription connected to your account, like you just have it on your own, you're going to be limited to 75. Yes. Yeah. The, oh, sorry. Yes, the question I got was, is that number uh, irrespective of the size of the files? Thanks. So what that actually is, is right now the uh, size of the megapixels is not managed. If you use the free tool, so Autodesk has a suite of tools for makers called 123D. There's one called 123D Catch. That one does limit you to the size of the resolution of the photo. So the ones on Recap do not. So the amount of photos that you're limited to depends on whether your username is connected to a subscription or not. So now once you've got that, you can always take a look at your gallery. You can look at your projects. Let's see if this one actually is there. There we go. So this one here is all taken from photographs. So we were flying this over Atlantic City on the, on the boardwalk for a few different things for that we were working on internally. And I didn't fly over the houses, which is why there's sort of shadows if you're used to point clouds where I couldn't see it. So some of that's a little bit messy. Now, whenever you're looking at this online, the model that you look at is going to be limited to 200,000 triangles. When you first open it up, though, it's going to tell you how many triangles the actual model is. And a lot of these end up in the millions. So this is just making it easy so you don't cons consistently crash Chrome or Firefox or whatever your browser of choice happens to be. So within this, if I want to, I can zoom in. I can actually see what's going on. You can notice how kind of blurry this is. But when I actually open this up in either Memento or Recap, it's actually going to be much clearer. Because again, it's kind of simplifying it for the web. But within this, I can orbit. I can actually see how much tessellation there is within this. So how smooth is trying to follow the actual events. I can also actually tell it to show me where all my photos were taken. Oh, yeah, those actually didn't finish loading on this one. So what it would do is show me a bunch of boxes in the air. You see if this one, there we go. Sure. Well, the photos you're referring to are like photos you take walking around? Oh, yeah. Photos? Yep. So the question I got was, the photos that I'm using for this service, are they photos that I can take just walking around or anything special? Completely. And th this example here, again, I flew a quadcopter. It was a DJI Phantom 2 with a GoPro Hero 3 Plus black on it. Uh, I mentioned that model specifically only because Autodesk only supports that version of the GoPro because it has a fisheye lens. They will automatically de-fisheye it for you when you upload it. If you're using any other camera that has a fisheye, you just have to de fisheye it yourself and upload it. But if you're using a regular camera that doesn't have a fisheye lens, no problem whatsoever. And in this case, this is actually the Microdisc headquarters up in uh, Nashua. So those are all the camera shots that I took of it. So flying around it for maybe six, seven minutes, just did one lap of the building, keeping it in sight, it builds an entire model of the entire thing. When I'm doing this process, so that last screen that I showed where you know, I'm saying, do I want this to be preview, do I want this to be ultra, after I've uploaded all the images, at that point, if I've chose to do ultra and I can give it whatever uh, units I want, whether it's meters or feet, I can actually pick three photos at least and say, from here to here is a specific distance. Once I've done that, the rest of it is all to scale. So by flying around this, it's maybe taking half an hour to go through all the photos I took, determine which ones I liked, upload the photos, do you have good internet? Awesome. If not, it's going to take longer than half an hour. Uh, then I can actually just go in and measure things and set it and set it to finish. So 
about three to seven hours, depending on how many people are actually using this, I'll get an email that says it's finished. So my total time of effort on this is about 45 minutes. And I have a full point cloud, 3D model, and actually mesh, textured mesh of this entire building and the parking lot. And in terms of the question that you had about what photos uh, do you have to take, I was actually speaking at the uh, Revit Technology Conference up in Vancouver last year. And I actually finally gave myself time to walk around a city I was traveling to for work. And I went over to the Chinese gardens. While I was there, this is the first time I actually used Recap. And if I had realized it would actually come out this good, I would have spent more time and actually stood on my tiptoes. But this is nothing more than photos taken with this cell phone. So I just held down my finger and kind of walked around it, walked it up, and then kept walking. By the time I got back to the hotel, my photos were on Dropbox. I uploaded the photos to 360, told them what I wanted to do, and that was it. So it really doesn't take anything special. The main thing is just understanding how you're taking the photos. If you're in a room like this, you're probably going to have a couple of problems. Number one, you've got a lot of walls that are just white, and unless you can sit far enough back where it gets all the reference information, you might have some issues. Uh, we've actually done some testing where we've gone with a bunch of uh, different colored post-it notes. So we'll put like blue post-it notes on one wall, green on the other one, just so there's almost like a mosaic, so that way the software can understand that, oh, okay, that's a different wall. And you don't want to stand in the middle of the room and take photos from that same vantage point. You either want to walk around the perimeter or take it from the corners in the middle up and down. The one, one interesting thing, though, is the Autodesk guys have said if you upload the photos sort of in order, not so much in the order they were taken, but sort of in the order around the perimeter, it will actually work better. You had a question, though? Rather than taking photographs, video. Uh, it, if you take the video and then you uh, take slides of that video, it can work. Uh, if you do that with something like the GoPro, it won't be able to do it for you, or it won't be able to de eye it for you, because what's happening is when you upload it, the software is looking at the, uh, the actual data inherent in the photo. So it reads it and understands, oh, okay, it's this kind of camera, this kind of lens, this kind of distance, let me do this for you. If it's the screenshots, you just want to make sure it's very consistent. So there are tests where uh, both Microsoft, a couple of universities, and Autodesk has run this, pulling photos off of uh, uh, like crowdsourcing. So probably about six, maybe six years ago, actually. I can't remember the name of the university. But they were using a program called Photosynth that uh, Microsoft developed, and they were tweaking it. They actually built the 3D model of the Colosseum in Italy based off of photos on Flickr. So it's definitely possible. So what you're saying is we don't have to hire a $10,000 consultant to do a point cloud for us anymore. We can walk around the job ourselves and make our own 3D model. Uh, for the most part, I don't want to say that because then I'll get killed. But uh, <laughs> so the, the question actually was, do you actually still need a uh, site surveyor, which is going to cost ten grand, versus you know a camera which you've already got in your phone? The, there are issues in terms of accuracy. Laser scanning is still more accurate, but the thing is, it's not by much. So as long as you actually take good photos and the size of the photo, or I should let me say not say the, not so much the size, but the detail, the amount of megapixels that you can get, that's kind of key. Because the more megapixels you have, the more data that you can put in there, and the more accurate points it can actually pull out. So that's part of it. And also being able to go into that photo and say, okay, I need to give you a scale. You know, with the laser scan, it's actually doing either time of flight or triangulation. So it's using the speed of light to actually figure out how far away things are. With photos, it's still relying on a human to go in and say, okay, from that corner there to this corner here, it's this distance. So that, there is that fail mode, uh, fail point. But it's not going to be there for long, I don't think. Understand you're talking to architects. Oh, yeah. This won't fly until we get rid of that $10,000 consultant. Oh, well, you can get rid of them now. I would just be really careful and take good photos. <laughs> so like anything else, it's a tool. If you are very good with the tool, it's going to be very useful. Uh, in a lot of cases, you can use this uh, in addition to them. Uh, we know of a couple of places that what they're doing is they're laser, laser scanning the interior, and then they're taking photos of the exterior with this, and they're superimposing the two. So that way they have a good idea of what the exterior is. And the interior, at the moment with the photos, it still has problems understanding you know, very similar areas. And you kind of need a fisheye lens to be able to capture a lot of information from not that far away. So it's possible. It's definitely going to get there. But there might be a few other things that eventually supersede this. Any other questions with the... Mm-hmm. Oh, let me actually show you. 
So we were at the AIA convention in uh, Chicago, and I actually flew the quadcopter in the convention floor one of the mornings before everybody got there. So I was kind of paranoid about security being a problem, so I did it really quick. Turns out that they were really cool about it. They, were, they, were, they asked more questions than anybody else did. So in this case, what I did was I flew it in front of it and in front of our booth area. So I can actually spin around and see the back of it, but it's going to be blank. It's almost like if you draped it, but you actually cut the drape off on the one side. And this is actually what I was mentioning. If you look at the very top, it's telling me that the mesh I'm looking at is 200,000 uh, pixels. The real one, the final, is about 2.5 million. So from this angle, it actually looks pretty good. But if I actually orbit over, zoom out here, you can kind of see what happens. So the illusion kind of gets broken because I don't have the information there. So it really just depends on what you've actually done. In my case, I took it up, flew it, looked around a little bit, got the info I needed, and got it down and looked around to see if anybody was running at me. So. Okay. Uh, y yes and no. So the question is, if you actually have a sequence of rooms, will Recap be able to stitch them together? Now the reason I say yes and no is that if you scan it with a like a, a normal total station, like a kind of scanner, Recap Pro can actually stitch everything together for you perfectly. Now I make that description or distinction because if you're using Recap 360 with the photos, I kind of have to have something consistent that I can say this is my origin point. So that way they sit next to each other and they know where they're going. So at the moment, they aren't, it, it isn't able to stitch together any point cloud scan. So I can kind of do that with other tools, but not so much with this one. Uh, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so if you have a consistent control point, then I can, like if it's in each one of the, the models that I upload, then yeah, it'll help it out. And if you have a lot of photos that you have of multiple rooms, but you're able to tell it in the software with control points. So I don't have to make separate ones and make a consistent point. I can actually take a bunch of them and move them together. There's one that I actually made that has a, uh, a tunnel. Let's see here. So if I hop over here. So essentially what I ended up having to do is create a lot of points to connect everything together so it understood how to actually merge it. And I ended up flying the little quadcopter under a small overpass where there were trains. And then that point there, because it's underneath it and you're looking at columns, which in that case were completely different from you know, flying around at 100 feet, I had to manually tell the software, okay, this is the same point that you saw from way up here. And once I did enough of those, it was able to understand that and actually make it work. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, thank you. To go to just yep. So while that actually loads, uh, no questions. No ch Nobody actually put one in that you saw. Just checking it, right? I'm just looking for 10 years. Okay. Yeah, I don't see anything in the questions or in the chat. Cool. So while this keeps thinking. Oh, perfect. Yes. Uh, it depends on the one that you're working on, whatever the source material is. If it's coming from a laser scanner. It could depend on the model and, in some cases, the weather that day. Uh, if you're doing it with the photography, it depends on the megapixels. So there's, there's not a hard and fast. It is this accurate. In terms of the units that I can use, I can set the units to be down to a 256 or you know a millimeter. But I'm really clicking on actual points from the scan to get that measurement. So it really depends on what it's coming in from. Uh, there was a question over there. Yes, well, it can. So when you create it, there is, uh, if you choose Ultra, you have five different file formats that you can pick. So if you want to just bring it into Max for rendering or for you know, scanning around that way, you have your, your FBX, there's an uh, inventor file. The RCS allows me to bring it right into Recap. And while well, this thinks for a while, what I'm actually opening up right now is a program called Project Memento. So anybody here familiar with Autodesk Labs? A couple people. So if you ever want to know where Autodesk is going with things, or if you wish that you could give them feedback on things that they're trying, say, this would be great if it did that, that's a great place to do it. So this is actually a pre-program that's on Autodesk Labs right now. What this actually does is it works with the mesh data that we're talking about. So 
granted, again, it's on labs, they want feedback, the interface is weird, I'll give you that. So it takes you a few minutes of figuring out where things are. Just remember, if you right click, it opens up more tools. Now, what this actually is, is again, another one that I actually did with the uh, quadcopter. Just flew it around for about six minutes at a client site just to show them this is what it can do. And then we actually created this. So it didn't take much time. They gave me the measurement of the glazing there. And I also knew the measurement of the parking spaces. So from that, I uploaded the image, got this. And if I do this, you can actually see how detailed the, the mesh itself really is. So the main thing about Memento is, number one, it allows you to manage and work with very, very, very detailed meshes. So this is in the order of over six million uh, triangles. So, and it's, for what it is, very smooth. The other benefit of this is that if I have things where I need to fix, so if I come over here and I realize, you know what, this area is just really funky. I don't want that there. I can always come in, set my selection, and just delete that whole area. Now the thing is, I don't want to have a, a big hole within my area, so what I can also do is come back through here, grab that, and then tell it that I actually want this to stitch that back up again. And I can tell it to fill it either fat, flat or smooth. So again, free program allows me to take this. And this data set is taken from the exact same point cloud. So by flying the photos, uploading them, I got number one a point cloud that I can very easily bring into Revit and then work with. I also have a mesh that I can work with, so I have solid geometry. So if I want to take the solid geometry into other programs, maybe like 3D Max, if I want to convert it into a few different formats so I can actually do wind analysis on it, lighting analysis, just depends on what my goal is. But it's just another format of the same reality captured data that I can work with. Any questions on that one? This does take a little bit. Uh, for which? Okay, question I got is where is the computation happening? Is it local on my laptop or computer or is it in the cloud? For what I'm doing right now where it's cleaning it up and stitching it back together, that's all local. Now, Memento also has a few features that are similar to 123D Cache and uh, a Recap. Its level of detail is sort of in between. Excuse me. So the current version of Recap, sorry, of Memento, allows me to uh, add photos to it to make actual 3D models. So I've already got Recap, I'm just using that one. But this here was all done locally. So whether they're going to offload that to the cloud or not, I have no idea. But at the moment, all the editing is done here. So that goes through and cleans it up. And if I need to change the colors, that's a different thing. That is still thinking. When you say another scan, which one are we talking about? By photos? Okay, yeah. So the question was, let's say that I took something and I realized it's not bad, but there's an area that I forgot to take photos of, or the photos weren't good, I didn't realize I had my thumb over it, or it was blurry, or whatever. It, do I have to redo the whole thing? Honestly, yes. So if I've uploaded 300 photos and I say, okay, I want to use these 250, one of the things that you have under all of these is the ability to tell it to resubmit. So if the photos I wanted are already up there, I just didn't choose them, I can go in and modify them, I can get rid of photos, I can put more points in and say, okay, I see I had a problem understanding this area. Let me put a couple of control points in and help it understand what I wanted to do. That's still going to take a few hours for it to actually put it together. My normal workflow in, in this, if I don't need it done right now, I'm actually going to run a preview just to see how it does first. So once the preview works and it's actually clean and it, I see if it does understand everything or if it doesn't, then I'll tell it to actually run the final one. So I can actually, if I've got all my photos in the morning, I'll run one or two previews during the day. By the end of the day, I've decided if it works or not, and then overnight I'll have it run the, uh, the Ultra. The next morning I've got the full model. So it just depends on how quickly I need it and if I want to kind of, you know, hold my breath and go Ultra right from the beginning. You had a question?
Mm-hmm. Is that the case? Or? Uh, I think it depends on what software you're using. When you're using Recap and I set the origin, uh, similar to how I did the select the plane, you know, I give it a variance. When I do the origin, I can actually get surfaces and say, okay, I want this surface to be my floor, or I want the surface here to be vertical. It can be a little bit tough depending on the reflectivity of things. So if you're doing, say, you know, they have a marble floor, well, that's really reflective. I can see there being a lot of points that maybe are just a little bit off. So maybe the variance on the floor could be, you know, an inch or so. If it's just a regular floor where it's, I don't say it's dull, but like wood or tile or something else, you should have a pretty flat area. And if you have a, an existing conditions building where nothing is level. Oh, okay, yeah. The uh, question is, is it difficult to take an existing area that is all over the place? So if you go to some existing buildings, the floors warp, the walls are not straight, is it hard to figure out which way is vertical? For me, I'll usually find something and just make sure it's plumb, so I at least have one, I, I at least have something that I can use to reference. Whether that's a tripod with a little, you know, uh, uh, level on top of it, and I know that this is vertical, so that way, as long as that gets scanned and I can bring it in, I have something to work with. So otherwise, if everything's all over, it's kind of a guesstimation game with that. I think what he's saying is it too accurate. Like, it's better when you get that, oh, yeah. that it's off by one, you know, 264 of it in. Yeah, you have to decide how accurate you want to model. The, the question is, if you have everything where it's, if it's scanned completely accurate, so in which case it's going to model reality. When you bring that into Revit, at some point you're going to have to make a choice. Is the work that we're doing just design intent and I know I have room for things? Or is this really weird and warped and I have to have a wall that shows itself in the model as warped just so I can understand this is really how it is? And maybe it's not just going out a half inch, it's going out three or four inches. So I need to know how much that actually protrudes. So if I'm putting pipes or putting in a fascia or facade or whatever, I need that. I, I've worked on projects that are both. Usually if, if I'm doing the modeling, the first thing I need to know is, do you want this to be modeled exactly, or do you want this to be modeled orthogonally lined up? And that kind of dictates how accurate my Revit, gonna, my Revit model is actually going to be. Am I getting the spirit of the reality, or am I, you know, dead on? Yeah, I, I would honestly say yes at the moment. It's, oh, sorry. The question I got was regarding the copter. It, are there liability issues with terms of flying, it, correct? Right now, I would probably say yeah. It, there, the FAA will say that anything you do with a RC anything, if you do it as a hobbyist, so I have an AMA card, I fly as a hobby, I've been doing it for a while, no problem, completely fine. The second you do it for anything that has commercial ven value, oh, no, no, that's, that's, that's illegal. However, having said that, they've already lost the one court case they had. The judge actually said, you don't have the, the right to actually enforce this. Normally, whenever they make these laws, they actually have to put it out to a public consensus, which they didn't. Uh, they've also said for, I think, the last two years, oh, yeah, we'll have our rules out in this year. They've already said back in February they weren't going to make their time this year. Most people in the U.S. are not waiting on it. They're just kind of, pardon the pun, flying under the radar. You know, you'll get a lot more things in the news now because they've, the news outlets feel it's newsworthy. Ah, oh, this hit people a watch. So you have the thing where the the not too not too long ago, actually in New York, a couple of cops said, "Oh, a guy with a quadcopter, he flew it up to 2,000 feet." No, no, that can't do it. So what actually happened? And the funny thing is, cops didn't realize the copter had a video on it. So the cops actually chased the quad. So it's a little bit of a gray area. You know, if you're flying over private land, and most private land does have a uh, airspace rights, I would say you're okay. Whether the FAA or the cops would say okay, that's a completely different story. Uh, I would just practice as much as humanly possible before you go in an area where anybody else could be. I've been, I've been following this, and there has been news in the last few days where state legislatures are starting into, oh, yeah. into it for security reasons and terrorism reasons and a whole lot of other reasons. Mm -hmm. It's a really cute idea, but I can see how it can be oh, yeah. uh, taken advantage. There's a However, fantastic video of Niagara Falls mm -hmm. out on the web done by one of those costumes. 
Oh, yeah, there's a lot of things. The comical thing is the government might say it's not good, but the police have already come out and said that we can actually fly this over your property to watch you, but unless we land on your property, they don't need to put a warrant. So it doesn't go both ways. So they, I'll be the first to say it. There, there does need to be rulings on it, but they need to do it before everybody else just decides we're not waiting anymore. Because every, almost every other country is doing this. Japan uses over, a th over probably 2,000 of them to manage agriculture. They can much more accurately go out and spray different fields. They can go out and use uh, infrared cameras to actually get information over their agriculture. So that way they can actually see what areas are healthy without having to send somebody out there. Police, fire departments, they're already using some of these for using to find where people are in a burning building without having to send somebody in there. I mean, security, military, all that's, you know, they've been doing it for a while. Uh, most time people think, think drone, they're thinking something that's like this big and carries a bomb, as opposed to something that's like this big and can barely carry an apple. So, yeah. the same PC. Oh, yeah. So it was expensive, became cheap. Oh, God, yeah. You can get one now for like 200 bucks that has a camera on it. So it's, it just depends on how much detail you want and what you want to do with it. You know, it's not going to stop it, but they do need to regulate it to some degree. But they, they actually need to get and actually do their job in my mind. So they, they're saying, oh, we've already approved one company in Alaska for an oil company. That doesn't mean much to me. So. Uh, a lot of the times what it'll actually do, uh, this one is to show it, there we go. Yeah, so what would actually happen is if they actually are blurred, and oh, sorry, the question is what happens if you have photos that are blurred that you've uploaded? So you've uploaded it, you chose it, maybe you didn't think they were that bad or, you know, along those lines. If Recap actually is able to stitch it, the imagery that you have on there, rather than being, you know, nice and, you know, detailed and tight, it might be a little bit more, you know, muddy. However, the other thing is on the left-hand side here, it shows me all the photos, and I can actually click on the photo and it'll take me to the orientation to see how it, you know, this is what I thought things lined up as. So you do kind of get an insight into what the software was thinking. But at the very bottom here, if there were any photos that it did not stitch, so it looked at it and it's like, you know what, I have no idea where this is. It'll actually show you those. And then at that point, you can say, oh, yeah, okay, that wasn't that good, I can fix it. Or you can say, oh, okay, let me go in there and I'll actually put my control points and help it understand where things really are supposed to go. Yep? I, I'm sorry, I missed that? Oh, the sun glare? Uh, hope and angles. <laughs> uh, it, it really does depend. Uh, I, I finally got my first person video set up for the copter. At first when I was doing this, I was just kind of looking up at it and taking a best guess or the controller I have can actually angle it. So I would take it to a different location and angle it up and, and down and hope that one of those came out well. So it's, if you can see what the camera sees, then you can actually move it in and out. Or sometimes if, the, uh, like if you're doing with the copter again, the frame is big enough, it can essentially shade the camera a little bit. But it, it does depend on the angle. Maybe if you're using different filters, that would help too. Not on the one that I have. Uh, the, the one that I'm using, the Phantom, the, if you bought the Phantom uh, Vision that, or Vision Plus, that one has it out of the box. The one that I'm using, the, uh, sorry, the question was, am I using something called Mission Control? I'll explain that in a second. I would need to buy, I think, like another $200 add-on for it to do that. So for those who aren't aware, Mission Control is, in my mind, what takes a UAV, which is an unmanned aerial vehicle, and kind of turns it into a drone. And my idea of a drone is something that can run on its own. So mission control for the copter that I have can actually run on an iPad. I actually look at Google Maps and say, okay, I want you to take off here, go A, B, C, D, E, come back and land. So you can actually lay it out, and even if you're not that good with, as a pilot, as long as everything's still working, you're just kind of hanging out or drinking a coffee and, you know, watching it, answering questions and looking out for security. <laughs> uh, the one that I have costs two grand if you include everything. And that includes uh, a, a tr like a Pelican case with wheels, uh, extra battery, you know, all the parts for it. You can get the copter by itself for about 600 bucks, I think, now. So it just depends on what you want to add on to it. But there's other ones now that you can get for about 400 and that includes most of what I have. It just doesn't have all the, I don't want to say AI, but the systems management, like the gyroscopes, accelerometers. If it actually has GPS connection, like the mission control, you can tell it where to go. But it can also just hover within a two-meter box. So if it's windy and I just take my hands off the sticks, it's not going anywhere. 
So it's it, 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 like anything else, you kind of pay what you want. Actually, yes, you could. Thank you. So right now I'm looking at 360 online. So the question that I got was, can I link this to a 3D printer? So I'm looking at Project Memento, which again is now a 3D solid mesh. Button right up on top here. If I can find it, there we go. Detect issues in model. This actually allows me to have it look through the model for defects, and then I can actually send it straight out for 3D print. For something at this scale, I have no idea how much that would cost or how long it would take, but I do know you can do it. So, so I don't actually have access to a 3D printer at the moment, which is probably for the best. But <laughs> Oh, yeah. So I keep going to the Maker Fair in hopes that I can find one really cheap, but not yet. It's getting close. So far, so good. Any questions? Cool. I'm sorry, I missed that. I got was, can I explain why these lines here are really squiggly? The reason why they're really squiggly is I actually didn't focus on that area. So similar to this. If you notice how the line is really smooth, but everything around it is really warped. This is like that because I just focused on and I walked around the line. So everything outside of where I was capturing is a little messed up. In all honesty, I was surprised at how good the, the parking lot came out because I didn't fly over it with the intent of getting that information. All I really did was fly over the front of the building and a little bit around the side. So you can kind of see how it starts to get warped on the outskirts. So this over here actually came out better than I expected because I didn't fly over it with the intent of getting shots. So it's not so much that it was reflective or anything like that. I just didn't get enough images of it because I was more focused on the building. So if I, had, if I spent more than four or five minutes on this one, I would have run a pattern and a couple of loops around the building, and then it would have been cleaner. Oh, the local ones. Um, actually, you know what? I'm not sure with Memento if it's if it's single or multi. So I know they have the version of it now is 64 bit. So I want to make an assumption that it's multi, but I wouldn't I wouldn't hold to that. I'd have to look through the forums and see if they actually mention that. Is there a way to simplify the missions? Uh, actually, yes. One of the things I've actually had to do is when I come up to the corner. Sorry, well, the question was: Is there a way to simplify the mesh? So. It's still looking for defects. But what I would end up doing is telling it that I want to export this mesh out. And in that process, I can tell it how much I want to decimate it. Essentially, if I've got a whole bunch of triangles, maybe I can make it 90%, 50%, 10% of what it is. And the nice thing is you can actually run that multiple times. So if you have something that's really, really detailed and I can't even bring it into max, I'll run it through a few times to really simplify it. It's going to get, you know, tessellated and a little bit weird depending on how many times I do it. But I can actually simplify it. Yes. Yeah, I've actually done that. If you watch the video that we have on our, on our YouTube page for flying over the AC area, there's a couple of images where I have wind analysis and solar analysis on that. And you'll see certain areas are really wacky and some areas aren't so bad. So what I actually did was I broke the model up into quadrants so I can export them out in different uh, levels of detail as to, you know, this one was accepted, this one wasn't. So I can tweak it that way. Cool. All right. Yep. Can you share your letter with the people who don't have a recap? Yep. Uh, well, I, they need to have an Autodesk account to be able to view it online, at least at the moment. So if they had, all they have to do is sign up for it. It doesn't charge anything. But if they actually have an account, all you end up doing is coming over and telling them that you want to actually share the file, send them the email, they'll be able to log on and actually take a look at it, but they do need that account. So if they have recap on the desktop, you can send them the recap file, and then they can actually watch it there too. Just, if you want to go online, you do need to have that at the moment. Can you drive this like programmatically? I'm Uh, I don't know. So the question was, can you drive this programmatically? I don't know if they've opened up an API for it yet. Uh, I know that they are looking at opening up some of their, the desktop recap API 
to work with actually, I think it's Leica actually. Um, I don't know about the website though, so I, I would have to check into that one. Cool. Oh, yep, thank you. So hop online, expand that. So nothing in the chat and no questions as of yet. Okay. So let's see, where are we? There we go. So now essentially this is where it is right now, some of the tools that you can use. Where it's actually going is not Ghostbusters 3. What that thing actually is, is a handheld laser scan. So that little spring on the end, that has the whole head bouncing all over the place. What it actually does is you walk with that through the site, around the building, in the building, and it's constantly taking a reading because you're moving with it and understands how to get rid of where you are. Now, this has actually been used on a couple of buildings, and it's the first time they've ever gotten an accurate laser scan of the entire inside of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Because they weren't able, like with the curving stair, it's not like you can put like a little trimble station in there and put all the markers on the walls. That's just, there's actually a video online if you want to look at this. He's just walking up the stairs, this thing was waving all over the place, and it's scanning it, and you can actually see the point cloud. It's actually really detailed. So this is kind of one of the things, rather than having to go out and set this station up, you can just walk around with it. And, you know, I don't know if I'd want people watching me doing this, but you know, <laughs> it does work. Outside of that, one of the other things you're seeing is Faro is actually working on attaching like a full-on laser scanner to the underside of a copter. Uh, comically, they've made it look like HAL, so don't ask it to do certain things or to lie. But rather than using photographs for certain things, if you're concerned about the accuracy of that or you don't want to have to upload them, find the clean ones, this sort of merges the best of the two. You can already put laser scanners on planes and cars, so this is putting it on a much smaller uh, test bed. And some of these that are smaller, you notice how it has uh, dual offset motors, you can actually carry pretty large payloads. And a lot of movies actually are doing things like this where they're carrying a full-on red camera and they can stay up for, you know, half an hour for some of them. Now, other things, anybody here heard of Project Tango? Awesome, a couple people. So what Project Tango actually is, is Google is putting a phone and putting a bunch of sensors and specific cameras in it. What that allows them to do is actually walk around and do interior mapping. So Google actually sold SketchUp. They sold it because it, they used it. They didn't need it anymore. They already have all the exterior maps. They've got a lot of exterior models. And at this point, photogrammetry is far enough. They have enough satellite imagery and drive-by imagery. They can build a lot of their models from that anyway. So the next big thing for them is interior map. So Apple's already getting into this. The next phone that they have is going to have a different method for it. But once they have interior mapping, then they can sell ads to you while you're walking through the mall. The benefit of this, though, is that right now, it's for developers only. Next year, you should start seeing consumer models. And with these, as you're walking around, they'll probably have augmented reality video games and other things that monetize it. But for other people, if you're in a site, you know, you have a little 3D model that you made, whether it was 3D printed, you're in a mechanical room and you realize that there's a problem, I can take out my phone and not just take a whole bunch of photos, I can take out my phone and kind of wave it around and then I'll have a 3D model that I can bring back to the office. So this isn't that far away, and it's already here. You just have to be a developer to get your hands on it, or know somebody. Yep. Now, anybody here ever uh, see the movie uh, Prometheus? I'm so sorry, but I understand. Now, in that movie, they had a little thing called pups. So what that was was a little ball that they threw, and it basically went through and automatically scanned all the tunnels in the movie, and created this really cool 3D model. Now, that's total sci-fi, doesn't really exist. However, they've been doing things like this for quite a while. So this one is from UPenn. I have another video from about three years ago that had MIT doing something very similar. So the number at the bottom is how fast they've actually sped up the video. So again, not really quick just yet. But this is just a quadcopter that has some bumpers on it and some automated systems. It's not tethered to anything. And it's flying through the building and automatically mapping it. So whether it's for security, whether it's for architecture, whether you're going to the site and you really don't have two people to hold the end of the stick, you go there, you drop this off, go somewhere else, get some coffee, have a project meeting, you come back, you pick it up, plug it into your computer. That thing is automated. Automated. There's, there's nobody flying. No. It's just, yep. just throw it at it. So essentially it has sensors, it knows where it's been, so it doesn't need to go back there. It has sensors that understand its distance, 
So it's actually able to say, okay, well, I don't want to hit that wall. I don't want to go there. Oh, there's an opening. Let me go through that opening. Uh, a lot of the universities that are doing studies with different uh, aerial vehicles, some of them are looking how we can have multiple vehicles connected and then separate. I've seen a few where they're testing flying them up and having them land on power lines to charge themselves. Some of it's scary. Some of it's awesome. Some of it makes you not want to watch the movie Terminator ever again. It just depends on how you look at it. But, again, this is here now. It's not ready for commercial use just yet, but it's also not that far from it. And in terms of setting things up for uh, being able to fly patterns, you know, letting it go and figure out what it wants to do, this one here is running through a building. And again, it's a school university team. They're testing this. In terms of things that are already out there, the video for this is normally much longer. I just trimmed it to show the specific spot. There's a company out there called SenseFly, and they sell that little plane with the cameras on it. This is actually the Matterhorn. So they actually flew the Matterhorn several times. The next uh, image is actually going to show you all the data and the numbers. They didn't use 360, by the way. <laughs> now, the next thing you see is not a, like a video. This is actually the point cloud. So let me move this out of so you can see that. 300 million points. So again, it's not sci-fi. It's pretty much there for certain areas. And it's already being done a lot overseas. There's another company called Pix4D that's been doing this for a while. And they do a lot for quarries, for mining operations, for agriculture, for infra uh, infrastructure and master planning, where they'll use a plane because it can cover more ground. It'll actually fly a pattern. Oops, it's on repeat, sorry. They use a plane because it can uh, fly the pattern and cover more area. And once it's done, it stitches everything together. A lot of the planes actually have a GPS module on it, so it actually understands where it was in the world when it took that photo. And then it actually puts it together and you use, utilize it for whatever your project calls for. Any other questions? Yep. Starting to, yeah. So what we've seen for a couple of the construction firms that we work with, one of them, we actually met with them. I flew around their building. They saw what it could do. And two days later, they went out and bought their own copter. So the guy's actually been flying around his house just to practice with it before he takes it to a job site. Uh, another company I work with, they're actually taking out the copter, not using it for 3D modeling, but they're using it to actually do inspections on the building for the curtain walls. So rather than send somebody up on like a cherry picker, they got one guy flying it, another guy sitting there looking at the screen, and they're actually reviewing all the sealant and all the joints for the curtain wall without having to go up in the air for it. So that way they can save time and just, you know, okay, up, down, good, up, down, good. So they're just doing it as a two-person team so that way they're, you know, you have a spotter who's making sure it's not going to hit anything. And they're the one who's focusing on the actual reviews. So it's the less reality capture, but they are using the tools in production. So and then we had one person that we were going to work with, but the project timeline didn't work. So it's, it's just about there. Do you think it, it's something an architect can use? Oh, gotcha. Uh, it would be a little hard to be... The uh, question was, is it something that an architect can use? Definitely yes. Uh, my only at caveat would be, if you're doing it inside of New York City, be very careful. Uh, uh, there are no-fly rules in, within specific distances of airports. I don't remember if Manhattan is a complete no-fly area. I'd have to double-check that. Uh, I haven't flown here, if anyone's listening. Uh, <laughs> So it, it kind of does depend on the site and the location. Uh, interiors, I wouldn't be doing it just yet, uh, just because it's you got to be really careful. Can you do it if you're really good? Oh, God, you. Yeah. Uh, there's a guy I know that flies regular copters, and he'll turn it upside down and cut the grass with it. And, you know, so it kind of does come down to skill level, but it also depends on the camera that you've got on it and how much you're willing to gamble. Even without copters, you take enough pictures. Oh, yeah. Oh. You would build it to start. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I do feel it would be as reliable, especially if you have something within the photos that is reliable in terms of scale. So if there isn't anything, I've gone out with like one of the, uh, like a, a drywall T-square, so it's you know pretty long. 
and I'll just leave that in an area where I'm taking a lot of photos. So that way, as I'm stitching them together, I have something that I know this is exactly this long, and then I can actually put that measurement into my photos. So I don't really care that it ends up in the model because, hey, it's at least accurate, and I can get rid of it and recap. So. When you, when you haven't shown us if or how this can actually go right into Revit, and I can start doing my model and start doing uh, drawings and dimensioning mm -hmm. things, yep. uh, can it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I focused on the software just because I only had an hour. But all of the 2015 software in the suite, AutoCAD, Revit, Navisworks, Civil 3D, InfraWorks, all of those can import any of the point clouds directly from Recap. So typically I go through Recap just to clean things up and also, if need be, break up the point cloud file. But if you want to bring in a point cloud in a Revit, it's no different than if you were to link in a CAD or a Revit file. It's actually in the same uh, import uh, ribbon. So you would just bring that in. I've seen it. Uh -huh. So the output from the image capture yep. is still a point cloud. Yes. So yeah. It turns my... my into a point cloud. Yep. So when I come here, I say download. If I click on the one here that says RCS, that's my point cloud file. So I would then take that RCS, open it up and recap. So this right here is actually the one that I did with the uh, quad copter. Once it, it gets, there we go. So we, before when I was in Memento, I was showing the mesh version of the result. This is the point cloud version of the exact same thing that I did with the camera on top of the quad. Everything in here is actually to scale because when I actually put it together, I knew the spacing for the parking and I knew the spacing on the glazing. So I gave it two different areas of measurement. From in here, if I need to, I can then say save as or export the file. Tell it which file I need to export it out. In all honesty, you don't actually need to export anymore because Revit can read the RCP file from Recap. But if I need to tweak it to something else, I can at least do so. Uh, I think this one was maybe five or six hours. So I started it in, I think I started around lunch and sometime when I got home I had the email, I don't remember how long. But it wasn't longer than six or seven. Uh, I believe the question was, the, making the point cloud is only available for people who have subscription. Okay. It's, Technically, yes. However, anybody can go on here and purchase cloud points. So the reason I say that is that if you do one here that is, yeah, I'll just go here. If you do one that's not ultra, so you just do preview, you only have a couple of file formats. So if I'm preview, I have the RCN. That's the mesh file. So that's when I can open up a memento. Once I go to ultra, now I get the RCS. Excuse me. The RCS file is the point cloud that I can then bring into recap. So if I have five cloud points or I'm on subscription and I want to spend five, then I can do it. You don't need to be on sub, but you do need to have the points. Um, maybe I should have one before, too. Yeah. Um, do you have any basic tips for getting the right kind of metrics if you're doing like shutter speed or high shutter speed? Or low shutter speed? Uh, God, I'm trying to remember the shutter speed. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. In terms of good tips, though, Try to go around the subject. So if I'm doing this room, I'm either going to eat, I'm going to walk around the perimeter, and then I'll do another one where the camera's at maybe like a different angle. So start low, go medium, go high, and then I would upload them in the order that I took them if I can, or I might renumber them if it's if I have problems. I might renumber them so that recap has a better chance handling. Yes. Uh, does it use the mesh file the Essentially, yeah. So it's not a point FBX. It's actually a sorry. The question was. If I choose the FBX, is it a mesh or is it points? If the actual result ends up as a solid geometry. So, yep. Why would I want to do a LiDAR if I could do a stitch with uh, In some cases, the LiDAR is easier. So if you're doing an as, sorry, the question was why would they would use a LiDAR as opposed to pictures? So let's say you're doing an as-built scan. So if you go to a place that's, at, that's just been finished, Chances are you have a lot of white walls that are just bare. Photos aren't really going to do you much good there right now. So there are still situations where the LiDAR is, in some respects, just easier because I don't have to be as careful as the photo taken. Uh, it also tends to have a little bit better distance. You know, if I don't have a $2,000 DSLR camera that's all crazy and high megapixel, at that point I can either buy the camera or I can spend and have some guy come out and scan it for the day. So it's, it depends on what I'm trying to scan. The photography is definitely getting there. 
I haven't because the only, I'm oh, sorry, the question was have I tried to export images from the videos? Uh, I haven't personally. The only reason is the main thing I was going, going to do that with was the GoPro camera. And then when I realized that there would be issues with the D-Fisheye, I found uh, a couple of other settings in the GoPro that allows it to either take photos every one second or just to shoot video so I can get it shot down to the first person and take a photo every five seconds. It, I believe it can be done though. So I just honestly haven't done it. Mm -hmm. uh, the question was, if I already have a point cloud, can I add more photos to it? Yes. Just realize it's going to have to rerun. If, if we're talking with the photo-based one, it's going to have to rerun. And that's usually why I do a couple of preview versions. So I'll find out, okay, did this do it well? Are there areas that are a little bit rough, like, you know, the car area? If I see that and I want to fix it, then I'll go back in and I'll tell it that I want to rerun this. And in that process, I can say, okay, well, I want to rerun it, but I also want to edit this. So I'll remove a couple of photos over here if I'm up against the 250 limit. I'll just say review project before submission. And then I can actually add more photos, remove photos, and add more control points, and then actually put in, well, maybe this is a little bit off over here, so let me put a distance in there too. So, but it is going to take, uh, as the other question earlier, it's going to have to rerun the whole process, so it's not like it's five minutes. It's three to six hours. What if the number of images go above the 250? It'll tell you it can't do it. So you'll have to cut down to the 250. Not at the moment, no. Or at least not with this program. So th There's other tools that still do this. This is the main Autodesk one that if you've already got Revit, you probably have access to. So, but like Pix4D, SenseFly, uh, Photosynthesis I think is still out there. So there's other options. And you saw the one with the Matterhorn where they had like 2,000 photos. They didn't upload that in 250 bunches. So there are ones that, you know, I don't want to say it's unlimited, and I would also expect to take longer than three hours. <laughs> it can actually handle a lot more. And I have a feeling that this is still sort of in the test bed phases for Autodesk. As they get more comfortable with it, they realize how people are using it, how they want to use it, they'll start raising that limit and tweaking how it actually works. Yep. I'm sorry? Oh, uh, I believe that's the inventor file. For the question was, what is the IPM file format? I believe that's the inventor part file. I, I haven't had a need to use it just yet, so. You had a question, sir? No? Okay, cool. Any other questions, guys? Oh, sure. Shoot. When did the audience start developing Recap 360? Uh, Recap 360, with that name, probably about a year and a half, two years ago. However, uh, they've had 123D catch for much longer. Uh, if you've gone to, if you got to Autodesk University over the last maybe four to five years, one of the areas where they have the Autodesk Labs team, if you've ever been there, you might remember they had this couple of uh, like shipping containers almost, or shipping boxes. That when they opened them up, they had about 30 different ca uh, Canon cameras in them. And they also had a little Microsoft Connect in them. What that actually did was the Connect was a range finder and you would sit down. And then once you were in the right location, it would immediately have all the cameras take a photo at the exact same time. And essentially what they were doing is using 123D catch to build a little 3D model of your head. So the other thing is if you've ever been in San Francisco and been in the Autolist Labs, uh, not studio space, but in the, uh, like the art, in the gallery space. They actually have it set there, so when you go in, you can actually do that. Uh, I've got two slightly awkward models of my head on my computer. So, but that's what the uh, one two three D cache tool. So they've been working on the technology for a while, but the like the pro version recap that's still relatively recent. And they changed the interface and how you upload your photos to them. I think last November is when they tweaked it. So personally, I like the old way better. It's easier. But. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then eventually you have a company or something. Can you merge them together so, so that you have a model of everything, even the one that's going to start covered? If it was done with like one of the tripod ones, 
Those tend to include data in it, so that way recap can automatically stitch them together. If it's coming from a photo-based one, you have to be more careful and give it some sort of like an origin point so that it would lay down where you want. At the moment, the version of recap that's on the desktop, it doesn't have like a move or a translate command. So when I bring it in there, I can't manually say, no, 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 this goes over here, and shift it around. So if in the process of doing this, when I'm giving it the control points, I say, okay, yeah, right there, that's my zero, zero. If I can do that, it'll line up perfectly in recap. If it doesn't, well, I can always move it around in Revit or in Navisworks or wherever else I'm bringing them, and then I can line it up there. But uh, the ones that come from like Faro and Leica, that has enough data in it that Recap Pro can automatically register and line them up. Yep. Uh, on the Recap 360? Uh, so the question was, the process for creating the point cloud is Recap 360 takes all the images and essentially it figures out like vanishing points, finds out where things are connecting and honestly I'm not sure of all the math behind it but it actually figures out how everything meets together and it builds the point cloud from that. So it's, it, it's like taking the mesh, all the triangles, of the, the points of the triangles, that's all my points. It's using uh, actual digital photos that you took with your yes. phone or something. Can you actually scan existing photos? I haven't tried that, I don't know. Um, I imagine since you can take photos from, you know, like Flickr and other things online, and just pull that down, and not all of those actually have EXIF data. Uh, I believe the question was, can you actually take scans of existing photos like uh, like prints, like a print or film? I don't know. I don't see why not. I just wouldn't want to verify the detail level, you know, or the accuracy, just because you know. That would actually be very really cool. That 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 is actually an idea. It's considering that. Well, actually, there's a lot of photos of Penn Station online, and I know they've used uh, 360 and some other tools to, again, pull online photos. There's a, a laser scan of Mount Rushmore that they did that has just photos from online, and they're not all from the same kind of camera. And so. the Chinese are trying to rebuild uh, the Summer Palace, which was Ooh. destroyed in war, uh, using uh, digital technology. I don't know how far they've gotten with that. That would be interesting, though. I'm not sure, but I'd like to try now. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't want to guarantee how detailed or how good it would come out, but it can work. That, that's the thing from when they pull all the Mount Rushmore and all the crowdsource stuff. I mean, the, some of the photos that they show, like these are the ones we use. Some of them have different almost like filters. The sun's in a different location each day. Uh, the one that I have here from that, if I zoom in, it's, oh, it's a little hard to see, but you can actually see the shadow on the ground. So if I, actually that's, I don't think that's a shadow anyway, but if I had different times of day, if it's using the shadow to help line things up, that might actually throw some things off. So the more similar everything is, the better, but you can still use the other ones. You just have to be careful in terms of, okay, I may have to hop in and let me remove this photo and add that photo or put a couple of points in so it understands that that's the corner of the building, not the end of the shadow. Okay, so the question is, if what happens if you gave it images of like just flat two D drawings? What would happen? Uh, I would say no, because it doesn't have perspective. So the main thing it's looking at here is when it takes a photo. So, yeah, well, when it looks at the photo, it can actually see. Yeah, and it's using the the different uh, uh, like angles from the vanishing points to understand all the different angles of the actual objects. So that's how it actually figures out where this camera actually was when I actually took that image. I actually have done constructive uh, perspectives with my four foot straight edge and then mm -hmm. finding the points. So I know the mathematics behind it, how you drop stuff, and ten hours later you have a simple perspective. So I, 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 I can guess on what they're doing there. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how it works, just with a whole lot of math behind the scenes. 3D trade. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, the easy short demos are we take photos and then magic happens and hey. Right, there's 11 million lines of code behind Oh, yeah. I don't want to see those lines. <laughs> so, so once you've constructed this passing, you can bring it into Revit and it's going to point cloud. Yep. You can place walls and you got it. directly. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, it'll snap to the uh, face or the assumed face of the surfaces, yes. And I've actually done that. Oh. Any other questions, guys? Oh. Thank you very much. Again, anybody has any questions and want to see more of this, you can either take a look at our YouTube page. Our channel has a couple of videos on this. Or just give us a ring. We'll be glad to help out and do what we can. Thank you very much, guys.